I know we don't have everybody here, but we have a lot of information, and we are going to solicit some discussion from you all. So we thought un very un steamboat like of us, but we're going to actually try to get started on time. Well, no, we're already here. So, you know. <laughs> Um, but, um, my name is Sarah Jones. For those of you who don't know me, I'm with the Tampa Valley Sustainability Council. Um, and we have Lori Batchelder Adams here um, from LBA Associates out of Denver. And she's really done uh, the bulk of this study. And so I'm going to introduce her um, and she can talk about what she did and results and recommendations. But before we do that, I wanted to kind of give you a background of why we're here today. Um, so first, looking backwards, what is kind of the history of recycling in Rock County? Um, Nipah Valley Recycles formed in 1990, <coughs> um, and they really did not, um, they were a non-profit organization um, to increase waste diversion in Rock County. Um, in 2006, we had the City Recycling Ordinance. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with that ordinance, um, it requires haulers to provide recycling for single family and duplexes in the city of Steamboat um, at, at the same price, at, at one, as one price, trash and recycling in one price. Um, we had the Green Machines in 1998. Um, green Machines, with funding from Route County, um, came to both Steamboat and uh, no, you should not Oak Creek and Yampa in 2000. Um, and this provided recycling, as we said, the ordinance came about for single family recycling curbside. Um, but that left a big gap of people, multi family, and folks outside of the steamboat who didn't have access to recycling. So the green machines were put into place to help with that. Um, they're no longer in steamboat, um, but we still have them in Oak Creek and Yampa. Um, we also, uh, we are on our fourth year, we just finished our fourth year of the <coughs> recycle drop off event. That's event, a big partnership, the county, um, the Sustainability Council against the Valley Recycles, um, as well as many community partners, Twin Enviro, Waste Management, um, who put on a day of recycling, the hard to recycle items. Um, we had a super successful event this year that goes every year. Um, just under 500 attending. Um, a huge amount of electronics, 28,000 pounds of electronics, huge amount of household hazardous. It's a much more efficient, effective way to collect these things than the curbside approach. Um, and let's see, 2008, I, have, I don't have my notes with me today, so I'm kind of guessing. 2008, um, zero waste started at the ski court. Um, and we had, at the same time, Secor Liz Wall, who really started that program at Secor, came to Twin Enviro and said, we need to have compost if we want to go zero waste. And so Twin Enviro started their industrial composting program. Um, and that they worked together to form the zero waste program at Secor. So that, that gives you a little bit of a background of recycling and waste diversion um, in our county. But why are we here today? So as any of you have seen driving past Safeway last year, um, those, the green machines were overflowing. And we hear all the time, Lori says, nobody is more passionate than people about recycling the waste diversion, whether it's for or against it. It's just something people are so passionate about. And um, we hear all the time, we were getting called every day, we really want to recycle, we need more recycling. Where are the opportunities for recycling? So we're seeing this demand. And yet, through our um, Yampa Valley Recycles, we coordinate, we talk frequently to environmental waste management, it's high, and they're saying, this is killing us. We can't afford to recycle. We're losing money on recycling. So we kind of came to this crossroads of like, okay, what do we do? How do we make it so that we can meet the demands of our community and at the same time not kill our haulers? Um, so um, last year, with funding from both the county and Ski Corps, um, we put together this scope of work to say, okay, we need some help here. We need someone who's smarter than us. <laughs> That's where we got Lori. Um, you know, we need someone to help us identify what are the current demands, what are we seeing, and then what are some possibilities? How can we move forward to increase waste diversion um, and at the same time um, keep our haulers at least op operating? 
Um, so that's, that's where we are today. So I'm going to take a quick break, introduce Lori, and then um, if we could have you do a quick, so Lori knows who you are, do a or super quick, just your name and, and where you're from or your organization. Um, so this is Lori Batchelor Adams. She's a consultant out of Denver. Um, when we were looking, when we developed the scope of work and we were looking, we pretty much found Lori and then we're like, okay, that's good. She is the person we want. She's had 25 years of experience helping um, governments with waste diversion. She actually did um, South Route study in 2004. 2004. Um, so she's very familiar with our area. And although she does focus on the Rocky Mountain area, she has Vermont to Guam to California. You know, her experience is very vast and very deep. So um, that is Lori. <laughs> Um, so, and then, Lori, if you want to come up and then, if everybody can just quickly go through who you are, and then you'll see who they are. Um, and that will help as we um, go through the discussion at the end of our presentation. Great. Um, so, right. um, I'm Lee Rogers, the MSLA State Building Mike Zoll, Brown County Environmental Health Department. Steve Johnson, Waste Manager. Kevin Richards, Waste Manager. Ashley Yancey, Twin Enviro. Marlon Mollett, Twin Enviro. Lynn Kalman, Sandhill Environmental Services, consult with the level of Sandhill Equipment. Okay. <coughs> Catherine Carson, Yamp Valley Recycles, Yamp Valley Valley Sandhill Recycles. Mm -hmm. Luke Tellier, Aces High, Royal Flush. Steve Wyman, Aces High. Janet Ray, Town Yamp School. Matt Schuler, Jackson County. Thanks, Jim Davis, Clark Scarf. Steve Woods, City Steve uh, Tim Corrigan, uh, Rock County Commissioner. Randy Radacia, Chamber and CMC. Tyler Gibbs, City of Steamboat, Planning Director. Uh, Deb Ginsmark, City of Steamboat. Caroline Jordan, uh, YBSC and CMC. I'm Betsy Blacka, I'm from Jackson County. Casey Earp, uh, City of Steamboat. Tom Williams, uh, Assistant Director of Maintenance for Mountain Resorts. Thanks, everybody. And this time, I didn't quite hear, I didn't hear from your affiliation. Uh, Clark Store. Clark, Clark General Store. Clark Store. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I heard Clark Store, like a company that I could, couldn't quite place it. So thank you. Great. Are we on? Well, I need to correct something Sarah said. You know, when they said they needed somebody smarter than them, they just couldn't find anybody smarter than them. So I'm just filling the gap until we get there. Um, and this has very much been a, a joint effort and uh, a lot of fun. But I want to, I want to uh, manage your expectations right off the bat. I think we probably have more questions for you today than answers. Um, this was a preliminary step. Not that these guys haven't been doing good things all along, but realizing that they were, as Sarah said, at a crossroads, it was time to step back and say, okay, how do we deal with this and all of our stakeholders and what makes sense for the future? Um, we took a kind of a baby step. And when I start doing planning work with communities, I, I always, you know, my first question is, okay, can we describe where we're sitting now? Do we know what the status quo looks like? Once we figure that out, I want to know where, what is it you guys all want to do for a goal at the end? Can we quantify X over Y period of time so that I know what you want for a, a start and end point? Because we always want to end up with a strategy of what we need to do. And when we started Rock County, we really didn't have either one of those endpoints. Um, not a lot of data readily available, so we had to spend some time getting that and trying to figure out what it meant. And then we said, okay, well, what's the other end point and what do we want to accomplish? And we smacked that right into the issue that we didn't know who we was. Um, are all the towns, you know, kind of doing their own thing with blinders on? Or are they going to work together and it's the county? Or is it going to be beyond the county? What makes sense? Um, so when we didn't have a we, we didn't really know what the regional goal was. So, we, so that's part of what we're asking. As we went through that process, we said, okay, well, as we figure this out, there's a few issues we need to be aware of and deal with, and there's some options we can start thinking about, but clearly we've got a little bit of work ahead of us. So again, it's a preliminary step. We're going to share what we have and then ask a bunch, a bunch of questions um, and hopefully get some discussion going. A couple of other disclaimers, if you will. The focus of this study is municipal solid waste. So the waste generated by businesses and homeowners. Okay? And within that arena, we're really focusing on traditional recyclables. 
Not that, of course, organics isn't a huge uh, contributor to waste diversion, but our focus was smooth mineral for the purpose of this project. And I'm not going to give much lip service at all to e-waste, HHW, special waste. And please don't take that to mean that those programs aren't important. What you do want isn't valuable. They have their own set of issues. But the purview of this study, you know, we had to draw our boundaries. So that's kind of where we're sticking. So let's talk about the status quo. And I'm going to just say over here, so I'm out of the way of the screen. Um, Based on the data we did collect, and this was a kind of initial effort, really digging in and getting data, and the haulers were really helpful in providing it. It may not be 100% accurate or 100% complete, but we'll, I think these guys in particular will keep chipping away at that in the future, and we'll always get better. But based on what we think we know now, in Route County alone, um, the municipal solid waste pie looks like this. And I'm looking at tonnages. This is weight, so this is all weight-based. So in 2013, it appears that you folks were successful in diverting 13% of your waste stream through recycling alone. If we looked at the organics recovery, primarily the yard waste and the food waste that's being managed out at Twin Enviro, another 11%. So the good news is that you guys were diverting about a quarter, a quarter of your waste stream, which I'm going to show you in a minute isn't, isn't too bad for Colorado. The bad news is, of course, you have to kind of always take a step back. You're putting three quarters of your waste stream in a hole in the ground, albeit a beautiful hole in the ground, but a lot of waste of resources. So is there room to grow? I say absolutely. I think the council and Yampa Valley Recycle says absolutely. Some might say, hey, we're not doing too bad. Let's leave it alone. I think that's a question for debate. So next slide, and that's me. Um, I want to put those numbers into perspective. So lower left is the state of Colorado. You guys beat the state of Colorado average in 2013. Not too shabby when all the front range is going into that. So you're diverting about 24%. There are 22. The state is the rest of us are at 22. So that's kind of good to know. Although we can't really say the state of Colorado is the mecca, is the standard we should be pursuing. If you look in the lower right, average U.S. is that much further ahead. They're diverting 34% or so. And then the real standard should be, but what we, could we be doing? So if you look at the exploded pine in the middle, that's our potential. If we were diverting at 100%, will we ever do that? No way, but we could get closer. So based on what we know about the likely composition of municipal solid waste in Route County, there is about low 40s percent by weight that could be recycled in typical programs that we have now. So I'm not even talking for about anything extraordinary. Another 25% is organics. It could be diverted through existing composting programs. So we could be putting a whole lot less material in our landfills. So that's kind of where we could be going. So room to grow. Um, I want to, I know you guys know programming, but it's going to set the stage for some of our discussions. Hey there. So I want to run over it just a little bit, probably more for my benefit than for yours. And of course I have to talk about the city of Steamboat Springs first because, you know, you've got a rural community but you've got a different um, set of parameters operating in the city. Am I screwing you up? Nope, I just don't want you stepping on that. Oh, okay. Thank you. For your safety. So, so Summer kind of spelled out what's happening in the city and they say you've got three big things going for it in terms of recycling. Um, there is enough density, enough population that curbside collection makes economic sense whether it's trash or recycling. So it's happening for recycling, that's great. What's great about that is it's convenient for people. All they have to do is roll it out to their curb. They have to drive it to a drop site, just stick it out of the curb and it disappears. The other great thing is single stream is pretty predominant in the county, certainly in the city. Single stream is very convenient. I can throw my stuff in that one bin in the garage all week, shove it out to the curb on collection day and done. Really easy, I don't need multiple bins. More convenient it is, the more I'm going to recycle. Just the way it goes. And then the third Benny in the city of Steamboat is the hauler ordinance that Sarah mentioned. Um, great to have that ordinance, especially in what we call an open subscription system. And that pretty much predominates in a lot of the county, certainly in the city. What I mean by that, multiple private haulers, they compete for business, the public is not involved in hands-on solid waste management. This ordinance says, have at it, haulers, do your thing. But if you're providing trash collection, you must offer curbside recycling to those same customers. It applies, as Sarah said, to the small, the small homeowners. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about where that ordinance could possibly go to do even more. But it is a great start. If you are looking for the stats, um, so you're kind of thinking, okay, a city is what, half the size of the county? What does the housing look like? A little uh, less than 50% 
are three units and bigger that aren't being touched by this ordinance, and what can we do about that? And there's some 1,100 businesses we're going we're gonna to hit on a little bit what could possibly happen on the commercial side. The one thing that isn't on here, um, and I want to mention, is that the city also has a requirement for new development. So for developments that include three or more units, this helps offset the ordinance. There has to be provided room for recycling. There has to be recycling facility space. So that's another good piece that maybe we could nudge a little bit, but that's there as well. So a good starting point, we'll come back to that. So, of course, there's more to Ralph County than the city. No offense, folks, but we do need to step back and talk about the rest of the community. The three other incorporated areas um, that you guys know well they don't have a lot of <coughs> dictate in terms of recycling. What they do have in these three towns is a contract for trash. So what this means is rather than have an open system, they say we want one hauler, we're going out for bid, we're going to pick one, and we're going to have really clearly defined you know, contractual requirements. Again, that makes me think there's something we might be able to do with that in the future. Our recycling in those communities is drop site based. So rather than curbside collection, you guys know what drop site is. Folks have to store their stuff, take it to the drop site, separate it out, or commingle it in, in, I think it's more the case here. And we get recycling that way. Drop site is a little bit less convenient. We tend to have fewer tons. Still a good solution for <coughs> rural areas. Uh, and I've got a list here in this little table at the bottom of all the drop sites. There are quite a few of them. Route County pays for and contracts for services in Oak Creek and Yampa, until recently they had the facility in Steamboat Springs. We'll come back to that. Cla North Route County, Clark Store. That is the coolest story. I mean, a community he said, we don't have recycling. We need it. We're going to make it happen. We'll figure out how to pay for it. We'll contract for services. Done. Um, you don't see that very often, and I think it's pretty admirable, so I love that one. And then there are a couple of other programs at the bottom. Not all free, uh, Milner Landfill and the Waste Management Transfer, if my facts are straight, have a small fee there. So, of course, when we have fees, a <clears throat> little bit of an obstacle for people to recycle sometimes. But, on the other hand, as Sarah said, economics sometimes drive that. Okay, so the big things um, in the county, we have a lot of curbside in it for half our population, so that's convenient. Single stream predominates, and it's primarily an open or private sector driven system in terms of actually collecting and managing, managing hands on those materials. Let's remember for a minute, though, that when we're talking about collection, that's only one piece of recycling. We need to figure out where those materials are going. It's not happening in Route County. So, what we see here is really the collection piece, and there's more to the story. Um, before I leave where we are now, I want to just give you some more numbers. This supports the 13% unless you think we made that up. Um, looking at last year where we have the data and then kind of looking uh, to a planning horizon in the future, blue column, the tons of municipal solid waste we think is generated. Okay? The orange column, if we captured 100% of those recyclables, that's that number. 2013, we actually captured about 3,700. If the math, math works, that should be 13% of the 28,000 total tons. When we look to the future, you know, there's going to be growth. More people, more waste. So that's our projection for the blue column there. And when you have more MSW, more total waste, you'll have more potential recyclables. That's the orange column. The big question is, how much are we going to be recycling in? 10 or 11 years. We don't know the answer to that. We don't know what you guys are going to do. Is it just going to be regular organic growth with no big expansions? Um, is it going to be more a way of life? Is the education and outreach going to make more happen? We don't really know. So this is a bit of a guesstimate. So you can just see what's going to happen. If, if this 8200 is at all right, even in 10 years, it's going to be two to three times the quantity of recyclables um, diverted, we hope. So you can just see the need for infrastructure and program changes, just, just with growth. So, for the most part. All right, let's talk a little bit about if we want to go forward with recycling, mm -hmm. what are we up against? Um, the Black Bear in, I think it's Big Bend National Park in Texas. And I saw this film, this, this shot, and I thought, this is what recycling feels like to me many days. <laughs> I feel like I'm out here all by myself. Um, I don't know where I'm going next. You know, what the heck's going on? Um, it makes me laugh. Okay, so the big issues. This isn't just Route County, this is all places rural, it's not even Colorado, everywhere. Tons, tons are the big problems. Um, we have fixed costs and we have variable costs for our programs. Those darn fixed costs get spread over however many widgets we've got, right? However many tons we've got. When we don't have many widgets, damn, that unit cost is high. 
so that the more widgets, the more tons we can have, the better our economics are. But that's challenging when we have a, a really sparse uh, population spread out over a big area, which is so true of many of us in Colorado. So we don't have a lot of people. We can't necessarily justify curbside everywhere. We just have lower tonnage generation. Uh, when we don't have a lot of policy initiatives, we don't have a lot of you will recycle or we're really going to make it worth your while or outstanding education programs that keep it in everybody's face all the time, sometimes we don't get as many tons without those. Um, the multi-single stream, we're going to talk a little bit about that. I know Route County is pretty committed to single stream, but there are some issues there. The industry is changing. I want to come back to that. And when we don't regionalize, again, when we're all doing our little programs with our blinders on, we're not taking advantage of you know, the, the lessons that everybody else has learned, we're not sharing resources, we're, we don't have the same message, you know, we're kind of reinventing the wheel, and we don't get, we don't have the success. So, so a lot of decentralized programs, lower tons, just a lower economy of scale. So that's going to be a big, a big focus. Whatever we do needs to support more time. Um, end markets. You know, we're not just collecting these recyclables for the heck of it and sticking them out on the back 40. I mean, we want to meet our sustainability goals, but we want to be able to sell this stuff. This is what makes recycling so much better than landfill disposal or incineration elsewhere in the country. We want to make money off this. But when our markets aren't right here, then we have to deal with transportation. Route County has virtually no end markets, right? You've got a glass outlet at the landfill, but not much else. Colorado, statewide, isn't too much better. Most of our recyclables are going to the West Coast, um, Pacific Northwest. We do have aluminum going to Kentucky, but a lot's going west, and sometimes it doesn't stop there, as you know. Guys, waste management, a lot of our materials are going um, through the LA ports um, overseas. And what happens when we have all the transportation? We've got to pay for it. So it takes a chunk out of our revenue potential, right? And we're starting to look at the balance of our costs and, and our revenues. And then we have an environmental footprint that starts to make us wonder, is this all worth it? Um, we're consuming fossil fuels, we're creating greenhouse gases. We need to be honest with ourselves when we do these programs and we're trying to justify them and make sure that environmental footprint doesn't do away with all the good of recycling in the first place. So it's a consideration. Again, more food for thought, more questions and answers here. Um, Partnerships and only having kind of quasi partial partnerships doesn't help us with tons either. And what do I mean by this? Um, again, I come back to are we all in a vacuum doing our programs by ourselves? Or are we working together to really leverage what we've got? When we don't do that, we, we can suffer in terms of tons and successes on the public public side. But there's public private stuff too. Um, if we don't have clear relationships, who's doing what, how's that working together, and everybody's saying, well, I hope those guys do this, and these guys are saying, well, I hope they don't restrict that. You know, when we don't really, we're just hoping for the best, and there's no really effective dialogue, and no answers, and no clear delineation of roles and responsibilities, <coughs> sometimes we aren't effective either. And I think there could be some room to grow, to grow as well. Um, when our tongues are up, because all these things work, when our economics are working, we give more uh, feasibility, longevity to our private sector service providers, and in turn, our public programs are going to be more stable. Um, and that's something we want to make more happen more of here in the future, because right now, it's looking a little dicey. We don't really know. Uh, the la oh, uh, speaking of partnerships, before I go any further, there's, there's other kinds of partnerships. Okay? I mentioned that really only collection is happening in Route County. We've got to do something with this stuff before we can even bother to drive it to the West Coast. We've got to make it market ready. Um, single stream, great. Um, it's convenient. We get a lot of tons. But that stuff has to be completely sorted before we can sell it to markets. And where does that happen? Certainly not in Route County. The, of course, we're the big star right there. Um, the bigger squares you know, rectangles of the little arms. Those are the sorting mercs. I just wanted to identify those because these are potential partners for the materials that we're collecting and trying to ultimately market. Eagle County, I want to mention down 131 in Wolcott. Eagle County, I think winds are conduit to Eagle County today. Um, these guys have an incredibly beautiful solid waste campus with everything there, including a sorting MRF, materials recovery facility. The restriction at Eagle County is that they can't take single stream. They built that MRF to accept dual stream. So they can take commingled paper and commingled containers. They just can't take them together. So they aren't right now much help with our single stream. They could, however, take multi stream. Possibly. They are paying their, their policy now, which with good dialogue, who knows, could change. Right now they are not charging to take that material, but they're not paying for it either. So anybody who takes material there, there's not the potential of revenue right now. And that's, that's tough. 
okay? Um, Boulder County has a public MRF. I don't really see them being a lot of help to you guys. In Denver, you can see the big squares. Those are the two big sorting MRFs in North Denver that control or ultimately receive, I should say, most of the materials that we recycle in Colorado. One is Alpine, or Altogether Recycling, if you know much of that, and the other is Waste Management. Full-blown sorting MRFs that can take single strains. Now, there are a couple little blips. Um, Larimer County's got one. Most notable to you guys is probably Summit County. What I'm doing with those blips is trying to show transfer capabilities. So multi-stream or single stream could go through there. Transfer is really viable because it allows us to aggregate tons, get an economy and scale rather than these drips and drafts. Uh, but they don't do sorting. They're, they're aggregating those tons and they're trying to improve, or reduce the cost of transportation, but ultimately they're getting materials to Alpine and Waste Management in Denver. Uh, so Summit could be on the way for route county materials if we're going down I-70, but they're only going to transfer those materials on to Denver. Right now, Summit has a pretty high tipsy. I think it's about, Summit here, we don't have Summit, right? 25 bucks a ton, I think it is, at their facility, right? And I understand it's going up. So for the privilege of carting your stuff all the way to Steamboat, you have to pay a tipsy, so I'm not certainly earning any money. So not that there, things won't change and we need to be talking to those guys, but that, that looks tough. Um, we know Meeker has a very small drop site for Rio Blanco. It's more of a transfer for multi-stream. That's how they're doing it, which I think makes sense for the rural area that they are. And then there's a private company in Grand Junction that deals with primarily uh, multi-stream. And Waste Management still has a facility in Curbside uh, in Grand Junction too, isn't it correct? Yeah. Kevin? And, but it's mostly for your materials? Yeah, it's multi-stream too. It's multi-stream. Okay. So just to give you a sense, of who else is out there and who we might partner with in different ways. It's not always the counties on either side of us generating more tons into our hub, but maybe it's somebody who works with us downstream. So just wanted to point that out. We had a public meeting, um, which I did by webinar, thanks to these guys last week because of the storm, where we had more of a public group. And they really wanted to hear more about the options for this, so I wanted to make sure we were clear about it. Um, and then, you guys probably know this very well, but I want to make sure it's clear that downstream of collection, we got to do this other stuff. We need to have an intermediate process of some sort, typically before we can get to our end use market, who actually on the far right are the folks that are going to take our product and make something new out of it. That's who we want to sell it to. Multi-stream isn't too tricky, again, because we have such small quantities coming in, we typically want to transfer that, bring tons in, and we often bail it so that the transportation costs are better. So we typically have a transfer bail operation, not usually outrageously expensive on a relative scale, so I gave it a $1 sign. Single stream is tougher, because as I mentioned, we gotta sort that stuff. So the example that we see for single stream in Route County, especially waste management materials, is they collect their, their stuff from curbside and drop site, but they, they aggregate it and bail it at the transfer station on Downhill Drive. So they don't do any sorting, but they bail it so transportation's better, you know, easier to swallow, and they ship it to Denver, and then those bales are broken and they sort that material there. And those are, you know, you still get your dollar sign for transfer and you've got to do sorting in Denver. And while these guys have it down to a science, the full-blown sorting process is a big capital investment. You have a mix of manual and automated equipment, you've got to do a lot of storage, and there's just, you know, all kinds of things happening. They, for example, like Alpine and Denver, do it on a large scale, so their economy of scale is good, but there's still a lot of costs. So big steps in there before we can sell stuff. So just wanted to make sure you guys were clear on that, and I know you probably are, um, but worth just hitting briefly. Um, the last issue I want to make is the big things we need to think about is this whole thing about single stream and commingling. Now, you know, in the United States, we have really moved to single stream. I mean, most of us, meaning everybody, has really embraced single stream because it has so many benefits. Um, but the downside is, of course, we've got to sort that stuff. And I wanted to just quickly contrast these two systems. I think you guys probably know it well. Um, we typically see multi-stream at drop sites. Drop sites don't have to be multi-stream, but that's where we see it. The logic being, you know, people have already done the work, your residents and businesses. They've stored stuff for a week or two till they run out of room, and they, they've loaded it up, and they've driven to the central drop site location. Why not take advantage of their, their good nature and have them sort it out while they're right there? Because that means we've got almost market-ready material. We might bail it to reduce you know, haul costs, but it's market ready. The, the generators have done the work. So a huge benefit there. Um, and the collection system is also cheaper. 
A lot of local governments in more rural areas tend to do this. And if you kind of run through these numbers, which are very approximate and relative, but trying to meant to give you a scale, you can see there is the potential to earn 20, 30 bucks a ton. The downside, though, is that inconvenience factor. It's that much more work for people to get less time. So it's always a trade-off. Single stream, exactly the opposite. Because it's convenient, we get more tons. The problem is the quality isn't as good. Um, glass is always our, our nemesis in the recycling world. The public considers glass to be the recyclable, so it's hard not to have it in there. But every time you look crosswise at, gla crosswise at glass, it breaks. And it contaminates all the other materials, and then you don't have, end up with good glass either. So that is one of the things that degrades our single stream. Also, um, even in the last two, three, four years, we have watched the value of single stream drop because we've become so virtual. The real high-grade material in our single stream is our cardboard and our newspaper and our office paper. Cardboard, we're doing a lot of online shopping, so that's not as bad. But our newspaper and our office paper production is down, and those are some of our highest value materials. So that's coming out of our single stream because we just aren't generating it in our MSW pies, right? What are we adding to recycling? Well, three through seven plastics, aseptic packaging, telephone directories, low quality stuff. So overall, we're seeing the value of our single stream drop. Um, but that's tough. That's what Sarah was alluding to, and I think what these haulers are seeing, the, the economics are just looking dicier. Um, so I'm not sure what's coming in terms of industry correction or what back upstream the public and the public-private programs are going to do to make that work, but it's something we need to be asking. Um, Processing costs for single stream can cost over $100 a ton just for processing. That's not the getting it there, the transferring it there, it's not the marketing and getting it to markets. So you can see, and that varies, if you don't have glass, maybe it's less, if you have a really clean material for whatever reason, it could be less. I'm just trying to give you a sense. So single stream, you know, it's a, it's a balance. So we need to be kind of asking about that and getting more educated and it changes every darn day. So it's a, it's a challenge for all of us. So I'm a Vermonter, so I can relate to your winters. Of course, I've been here for a few years. And again, this is another one that gives me a chuckle, and I don't mean to be too much of a pessimist. But um, so now we know what we're up against. We know where we're starting from. What are some, some things we can consider going forward? So let's do some options. Um, as I said, the name of the game is more tons. We just have to do more tons if this is going to make sense if we're going forward, to, especially to help with the economics, but also to help with our sustainability goals. Um, and if we, if we get those economics, we can kind of drive everything private, public, and everything in between. And there are a number of ways to make that happen, and I want to talk about a few of them. can't talk about everything, but we'll talk about a few examples. And later on, if you guys have more questions, we can go elsewhere. Um, but incentives. How do we create incentives to get our homeowners and our businesses to do more recycling? Well, they can be voluntary carrots, or they can be big, fat, heavy sticks. <laughs> And the politics of where you are have a lot to do with which way you go. Uh, but there are a few examples we can talk about. Does everybody, is everybody familiar with this concept of pay as you throw? Is there anybody who doesn't really quite know what it is, but I'll go over it. I'm seeing no reaction. So, okay, I'll talk about this a little bit. Pay as you throw, P-A-Y-T. Um, there's other names for it, variable pricing. It's really the concept of having, and this applies to trash. Let's just think about trash for a minute. It's the concept of having multiple service levels for trash and therefore multiple pricing levels. Okay, why would we need to do that? Well, think about it now. Most all of the pricing here in Route County is flat. Um, even in the city of Steamboat with their ordinance, they may require that the pricing covers the cost of trash and recycling, if you get it. That might be a bundled, but it's still flat. In other words, I can trash my brains out and it doesn't matter, I'm not going to pay more. Or I can be a really good recycler and composter and have hardly any trash and I'm still going to pay the same. So pay as you throw creates an incentive of getting you to trash less, ostensibly by either not creating it in the first place or doing a lot of recycling and composting, and rewards you with the ability to have a lower bill. So that's the concept. Um, some, nearly 8,000 communities in the United States do pay as you throw. And we've got a couple dozen in Colorado. So it's not a new thing. It is far and away the most effective means for residential recycling increases. So we're really missing the boat if we don't at least talk about it. Um, so it's like utility bills. You know, you, you pay for what you use. You, if, you're, if you're a bad recycler, you pay more. If you're a good recycler, you pay less. I hate to use those terms, but I think it gets the point across. 
Um, the other point, the other thing that, that local governments can like about pay as you throw is it seems, and, and generally is, relatively easy for a government to make happen. They typically do this in an ordinance type scenario, and it applies to whoever's doing the hauling. It's really the haulers that would implement this. So if your public policy piece, you're, you're getting this passed at the policy level, isn't too onerous, the local governments are kind of done. They've told the haulers, you do this. Okay, so, so local governments can find this easy. Is that true in Colorado? As Sarah was saying, we find trash to be extremely emotional, extremely tough in Colorado, so we have to be strategic about the policy piece. It's not always the easiest thing, but it's, it's doable if we're smart. The con side, of course, as you can see this, we don't really see this in unincorporated areas where there isn't local government control, so it's kind of a, uh, in the cities, and it's a residential piece. Commercial, by the way, is almost inherently pay as you throw. Usually the pricing structures kind of do that anyway, so we focus on residential with this. Bad recyclers are going to have price increases, and they are going to like that. That's something to deal with. And the haulers are stuck with the implementation. And the haulers can be public in some communities. Here they happen to be private. So what does that mean? Well, the haulers have to figure out multiple levels of trash service. How am I going to do that? And you don't have to do the big city models like San Francisco and Portland and Seattle where you suddenly have to buy all these multiple size carts and have big inventories. You don't have to do that. It can be, it can be simpler. We can do variable pricing by allowing folks to have a couple, three bags of, of trash and have different service levels. So it might be 1x for bag 1, 2x for 2 bags, 3x for 3 bags, something like that. So we can use bags realizing we have wildlife issues. We can use carts or containers of the same size, but you can have 1, 2, or 3, and you have different pricing depending on that. So there's ways to get around it. The other tricky thing for haulers is they have to figure out a pricing st structure, and that is a challenge for haulers who've never done it before. It takes a little bit of thinking. So yes, there's some upset, uh, upfront um, issues that need to be worked out, but the benefits of pay as you throw are huge. I can't give you exact numbers of what the results are going to be, but communities around the country, um, anywhere from 25-30% increase in recycling, upwards of 200%. Now, extreme, um, we, we might see something closer to 50-75% to increase, but that's huge. And we are talking over a couple of years of maturation, but that's a big dent. So it's something that at least think about. People, the naysayers will say, oh, we're going to have illegal dumping. And I will tell you that 8,000 communities would probably agree with you, but they would also tell you that that issue is pretty short term. The illegal dumping has not proved to be insurmountable by any means. It's over pretty quickly once the implementation is done. So an example of an incentive that we ought to look at, there are a gazillion more. Um, here's a few other policy-type incentives. We could do disposal bans which simply says, hey, we got plenty of infrastructure to collect cardboard around the county. We're not going to put it in our trash anymore. I'm not saying you're there yet, but it's an example. Same with, say, <coughs> and there are other materials. Okay? In the state of Colorado, we have disposal bans on motor vehicle waste, tires, oil, batteries. And as of last July, we have a disposal ban on e-waste. You guys are probably familiar with that. So other things can be done. They can move on to our recyclable. Then we can talk about some sticks. Um, universal curbside collection. This is a concept whereby a city would say, okay folks, residences, you all must subscribe for curbside collection. No voluntary. So say Steamboat said that. Right now we don't know in Steamboat how many folks have curbside collection because we haven't gotten that account information from the haulers. So we don't really know what the participation level is. We know there's a, there's a chunk of folks who do self-haul. They probably aren't doing a lot of recycling. So the city could say, or other cities could say, you all have to subscribe, no more self-hauling. Kind of a big stick. The advantage, though, is that we know when people have curbside service, they recycle more. So it's, it's another thing to look at. And then we could have mandates. Um, you guys have been working on residential recycling. The Mountain has done some great things with commercial, and I'm sure a lot of, of businesses in, in town have as well, and throughout the county. But we can talk about mandates there. We can require businesses of a certain size to recycle X amount of materials or X types of materials. We can tackle our businesses that generate a lot of food waste, the bigger ones, and say you got to do a minimum amount. We've got to program <coughs> that. Not saying that's a in the near future, but there's examples that are out there, so I don't want to belabor that. Um, other ways to increase tons, make sure we darn well have access for recycling for everyone. Um, and I've gone off on a little bit of a tangent here on the drop site because we know that in the city of Steamboat, the county's program has been aborted for the time being, both because of costs and area restrictions. Pretty popular, though. There's an example of the program with 
you know, with a lot of overflow. And as I understand it, the, the drop set collection was only really over weekends, kind of a Friday night, Saturday. So, you know, a lot of pent up recycling. The drop site that was, that was in the city was meant to serve um, the residents that weren't necessarily covered by curbside, meant to serve county folks that were coming through the city on the weekend. Um, so there may be a short-term need to deal with that right away because we have folks who simply aren't recycling in the meantime and do we want to jump in and catch that. So part of our study was to actually do some real numbers around that um, and we were fantasizing about how that would look because we don't know yet. We don't know whether the county would bring that back in and do it the same way which is to hire a contractor to make it happen and the contractor would make it so with their containers and their hauling. Or maybe somebody, the county or other, would say, we're going to start from scratch, this will be our baby, let's, let's see what that would look like. In that latter case, if that happened, we said, well, what makes sense? What's the most flexible and the most economic? And we would throw out that, gosh, maybe we could have drop sites, one or two or others throughout the county, that could be loaded on really simple trailers and pulled by a pickup truck. Again, trying to think low cost. Um, and what if those trailers could start out being multi-stream if we wanted to go that way and maybe could be morphed by taking out the dividers to be single stream? We don't know which of those designs even makes sense, but we've kind of looked at, at how that would work. And yes, could we have more recycling over the month or over the week? Uh, maybe not 24-7 by any means, but could we have weeknights and weekends so that people could get their materials in there and not have the big plug on the weekend? So there were a few things we looked at. Um, and I think I'll come back to that in another slide. I think I have the numbers for that. Okay, so those are just some options for getting more time. Um, so again, lest you think I'm making this all up, I brought some examples with me. I think this is uh, Waste Manager at Franklin Street, right? And I took that. They didn't provide that. It was me visiting, so no, no, uh, no um, unappropriate uh, uh, advertising there. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, Colorado examples. Now, don't be throwing any fruit at me that I am not bringing you good cities. I think these are good cities. Yes, they're way bigger than Steamboat. They're bigger than Route County. But they, you know, you guys, I, and I always get this. In fact, I made the joke the other night that I don't ever dare bring Boulder examples with me elsewhere because people say, oh, yeah, that's not even out to me. No, 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 we're not, we're not paying any attention. And, you know, the same thing happens at the state when we talk about California and everybody wants to hear. But, you know, they have gotten themselves bloody figuring out some things. We're crazy not to take advantage of at least what they learned. I mean, why, why do it all over again ourselves? If they've done something we can steal, you should. So just a couple of things I'm going to share with you. These guys are both in Larimer County. Um, they both have recycling collection. They do it differently, though. Or, and they both kind of lead the state, and they're pretty good leaders in the Rocky Mountain West. But um, they, they do it differently. Fort Collins has, like Steamboat, an open collection system, so multiple private haulers. They also, like the city of Steamboat, has a, has a hauler ordinance. Their hauler ordinance says trash haulers got to provide curbside recycling to residents. They got to bundle the price so it's one fee. The value of that bundling, by the way, is so that recycling is available at no extra cost. Not that it's free, but no extra cost. Because you have to pay an extra bill, nobody's going to want to do it. So they, they bundle it. But they say in Fort Collins, got to be variable rates, got to have three levels of service, and a lot like what we talked about before. It's for single stream. The other thing about Fort Collins, they have a cardboard disposal ban. It's only a couple years old, but they figured it out. Good example to look at. Let's look at Loveland. They have their own trucks and drivers. They collect their own stuff. Trash, recyclables, and organics. And they do a couple interesting things. They have that universal mandatory service I told you about, and it's mostly mandatory pay. So they say to all their small residents, we don't care. you got to pay the city to collect your stuff. You don't have to use this. You can go find a private hauler, but you've got to pay them too. We, we, we want that commit from, commitment from you. So they, they've got everybody signed up. They're getting the recycling, and they've got a constant cash flow. So there's some benefits, benefits there. Loveland, single stream, no glass. They collect their glass for, for, uh, via drop sites. So they work at keeping the quality of their single stream up. They're kind of chipping away at that economic piece. Look at those diversion levels. Not a lot of composting happening in Fort Collins, uh, more happening in Loveland, but a little bit higher than 13 and 24%. Big cities, though. Not only are these programs mature, but look at the people, you know, and you can, you can extrapolate the amount of towns. So they've got an economy of scale. Things happen. So, okay, that's not exactly like Route County. Here are a couple closer to home examples. And again, I know you may not uh, align yourself with Aspen and Vail always, but again, good examples. Much smaller communities. Very much like Steamboat, urban area, big rural county that you're in, and guess what? A, a ski area next door. 
So Aspen also, open collection system with a holler ordinance, and they break it up. They don't deal with just single family. SFU is single family homes. Uh, one, one unit usually, sometimes they say one and two. So they say curbside recycling, got a bundle of the price, pay as you throw. And then they say, oh, and for the rest of you, your large homes, the MFUs are the multifamily units and commercial. You get to do this too. We're just going to let you off the hook with respect to pay as you throw. So they capture everybody. They don't just focus on the small residential. Aspen has a yard waste disposal ban. Pretty cool. Um, Town of Vale has a brand new ordinance. Um, they don't really have a lot of good results yet, but they too say, we're talking to everybody. It's not just going to be the homeowners, it's going to be our big condo and apartment units, and it's going to be our businesses. We're all going to do this. Diversion goals and results here are a little <laughs> bit lower. These programs are a little bit less mature, and they're smaller. The economy of scale isn't there, so it gives you that feedback. One last example, because it's my favorite. I know it's not Colorado, but Teton County, Wyoming has done some amazing things. And look at those population numbers. They're almost, almost exactly like Route County and Sweet Boat Springs. Um, and they have a ski area there, Jacksonville. Uh, they also have a couple of national parks. What they have different from you guys is they have no room for a new landfill. So they have to transfer all of their garbage and ship it nine miles out of county. Tip fees, 110 bucks a ton. Exactly twice of what, where Milner Landfill is now for your uh, commercial loads, right? Just to give you guys a sense. So when you have that kind of driver, I was talking to the woman up in the back about East Coast uh, trash, when your landfills are really expensive, suddenly recycling looks good. And that's a tough thing we deal with in Colorado. Generally, our landfill tip fees are not too high. Um, what's really cool about Teton County is they serve almost the entire county with multi-site drop sites. No real curbside for them. It's very minimal. Multi-drop sites. Multi-site drop sites. So their entire public and all their tourists go to centrally located drop sites, divide it out, and the county deals with it. The county, this is a very mature program. The county has been harping on this and educating up the yin yang for a long time, and they've been very successful. The county also has that intermediate piece. They have a recycling center where they aggregate, they bring in all the tons from their drop site programs. They store them until they've got enough to make bales. They bale them, and then they store them until they've got a semi-trailer load, and they mark it direct. So they keep their materials close, they figured out how to manage them and make it work, and they ship almost exclusively to markets. Sometimes they do a little bit of milk run type things. But they really make it work, and they don't rely on big hubs, which you couldn't do in Wyoming. You know, where, where the heck are they going to go? They're down to Salt Lake, probably, or here. So they make that work, and as a result, you can see here, they earn revenues that cover 75% of their programs. What, what landfill can say that, right? I mean, before you put tip fees on, right? So um, I think that's pretty viable. They are actually talking single stream because 34% isn't high enough for them. They're talking about whether they want to do that, but they feel it's really sliding backwards because they've got their public so educated. If anybody is looking for a good program to visit and you want to do it in the wintertime, this is where I would go. They're very progressive. Um, so, okay, good information, lots of questions, lots of obstacles, things we could do. What are we going to do? Um, Again, kind of a little slide that gives me a chuckle anyway. Um, and there's a number of next steps that I've laid out here um, that I think are things that could happen and probably might make sense to happen sequentially. The big focus that I would have for recommendations at this point in time, if I was to be very brief, would be to say, I think this drop site issue in the, st in the city of Steamboat that also serves the county should be reconciled sooner rather than later because you're losing recyclers and once they fall off the wagon, it's hard to get them back. I think a big education outreach push is needed. You can't do, you know, big changes without really explaining it to folks and having good messaging. And then thirdly, I think getting the city of Steamboat Springs to do something with their ordinance, and I can talk specifics in a minute, is a really good, important short-term step. And other things will blossom from that. And not to put this, the pressure on the council or YBR to do education or the city of Steamboat to make the big policy jump, but I think those are good starting points and others will will jump on uh, with those to begin with. I think they're good foundation. So let's talk just a little bit about I have a lot of words here. I'm just going to hit the high points. The drop site, again, I've got two or three steps here. We've got to figure out what that's going to look like. Who's really going to own and operate that? Do we leave it for the county or are others going to get involved? Or is it going to be private or public-private? You know, we've got we to figure that out. What is the design going to be? Are we going to do multi-stream or single-stream? We don't really know yet. On the right, are, who are we going to pro uh, 
partner with to locate those puppies? I mean, are we going to maybe have a business that allows us to put a drop site on the edge of their property? Are we going to find some public land? What are we going to do? Who are we going to partner with in the materials we collect? If it's multi-stream, where are we going to take it? We could take it to waste management who has a single stream transfer station in town. Is that the best economics? We, we don't know yet. Um, and then there's the other communities that we talked about on the map before. So lots of questions for the drop site. Uh, I don't, I, I would hate to see that hold you all up from moving forward on it though, because it's already been a number of weeks and months. Um, did pull together, as I warned you, some costs on drop sites. Again, this is our fantasy set up for you guys. It may not look the same when you get down to it. We don't know who's going to own it. But if we were to do a towable um, drop site configuration, this looks a little different than what you might have seen at your green machine. It is not the as big, these units are about 21 yards. Some of the draft site units are probably as big as 30. Maybe in, in, in elsewhere where you have more times they're as big as 40. And they require what we call roll-off hoist, specialized trucks that can come along and pick those up. And those are expensive units. If we could do this with a pickup truck that we might already have in, in our fleet, you know, we could, we could help with costs. So if we're going to capitalize this and we want to have two containers and store up to eight materials at one site, my thinking is maybe glass would be separate because we've got an outlet for glass and we have a different container. So we want to have a couple containers. We want to have a trailer. Our first site might be in the ballpark of $60,000. That would include a trailer that could be used for all sites so that our subsequent sites would be just the $40,000. Ideally, we would go out and get grant funding for this. And the state of Colorado Recycling Grant loves this sort of project. So I think it would be a feasible uh, solution. So that would mean we're left the annual hauling costs. And we've been pretty conservative here. I think we've said if we have a 10,000 person service area, which, which might be about the right size for a steamboat location, again, serving the county, we might need as much as $13,000, $14,000 a year to pay for our, our driver and all the fuel and supplies and to amortize our truck and our trailer. So full, full gamut of everything, licensing, taxes, et cetera. We have a smaller service area that we might see in South Route County or similar to what we see in North Route. Um, the, the operating costs will be less because we're pulling less tons. And in our report, we've worked these costs up a little bit. So if any of you are ready to launch a new drop site program, you're, you know, you're ready to go. Um, so funding is the issue. I mentioned grant funding. The state of Colorado has a program, and they especially like to fund hub and spoke programs, where we have really effective in rural areas. We have a place where we are aggregating those tons, say that transfer intermediate concept we talked about. So the small quantities coming in from our collection spokes can be aggregated. We can transfer them, bail them be a little more effective. So the, the state likes to pay for hub and spoke. They like to pay for projects that are serving bigger regions, people working together, collaborating, more, more spokes. And they like to pay for capital. Um, I will mention, I'm just going to throw this in, the U USDA has a funding also that they give out every year. And they like to fund planning and education training. So I think they both make sense for what you guys are doing. And to the extent you can work those, that's something to do in the future. Um, because education and outreach needs money too. We need to capitalize drop site, but we need to do a big outreach push. And that can be significant dollars for an initial campaign, get people, get their attention, then back off and maintain for fewer dollars. But we might want to find what that is. So how do we cover those operating costs? You guys are probably familiar with the fact that Route County assesses a landfill tip fee surcharge at the landfill now. Everybody kind of familiar with that? That's 40 cents a yard being assessed right now. 25 cents of that is going to recycling programs, whether it's the, the work that Council and YBR does or it is the drop site program. Um, let me give you some relevance to that. You can correct my math, but I think a, a good ballpark is the $55 a ton at Milner Landfill. If you converted that to cubic yards, it would be about 17 bucks a yard. Okay? So 17 bucks a yard, 40 cent surcharge. That's what that looks like. So, is there any political will to make that 40 cents bigger and generate more funds? I don't know. But would 60, 80 cents be painful? I mean, that's something for you guys to figure out. But if you could double what Route County is pulling in and they could use that to fund more program, more education and outreach, how great would that be? Might not about be the be all and end all. You might want to keep looking for other solutions so you have some redundancy, but it's a place to start. Um, regionalization. Haven't really spoke to that yet. Route County and your 24,000 people, not bad, you're doing good stuff, but you're surrounded by counties, Jackson, and I don't think Moffitt is here, that are struggling. Um, you've got Moffitt and you've got Rio Blanco even. Rio Blanco two years ago did a recycling study and they said, yeah, we'd like to do more, we need more tons, 
you know, and they kind of sat there. I mean, not that they aren't doing good things, but nobody's, you know, partnering with them. If we could do their tons and Moffitt tons and Jackson tons, we could be a hub here. We could get state money and we could think about what makes sense. I mean, it sounds great. A lot of work, a lot of questions to be answered. Um, Jackson had a recycling program. It went by the wayside recently when their recycler in Wyoming stopped doing recycling. Um, Moffitt Recycling, as I understand it, really is the city of Craig, or it's the town of Craig. And Craig um, does multi-stream drop site collection and they bring their materials to waste management right now. And I believe they do that and get zero revenue in the current economy. So they do that recycling and they get zero revenue, but it works for them now. But what if we could come together and do more and all of us could make a little bit of money, a little better revenue share? Just something to think about. Um, are we using our resources appropriately, especially education and outreach? Do we have consistent messaging? Are all our programs collecting kind of the same things? Because as soon as you create any confusion from one drop site to the next to a curbside program, I give somebody an excuse to say, oh, to hell with it, I'm not going to do it. So lots of reasons to kind of think about that there. Again, this is going to take a lot of dialogue and a lot of thinking and number crunching, but this is the time to say, could we do it better? Um, Grassroots stakeholder support, task force sort of thing. Um, this hopefully is the genesis of that, and that's why we've got all your, your personal information so that we can, we can hound you after the fact. But we need a good stakeholder spa uh, group base to spread the word, to help educate, to generate support, to continue to create demand and convince our city councils and our county commissioners that we need all of this. And you can see they need to include everybody. And we need our generators, and we need our service providers, we need our local governments. We need not only staff from these organizations, the ones that are organizations, who actually have to make things happen, but we need our, our decision makers as well. So ideally we'll have some council, and we'll have some staff from the appropriate organizations, or we'll have corporates, and we'll have <coughs> staff, um, C-Corps, or whoever that might be. So we want to include everybody there. We need these guys to help us with our public policy as well, which I'm going to talk about in just a minute. And I've mentioned education and outreach. Um, it seems like such a soft thing and an afterthought. It shouldn't be. We need to have a consistent message so that we're kind of saying the same thing to everybody in our area. And again, we don't know what that area quite is yet. Is it Route County or beyond? We want to have some really simple branding that's instantly recognizable. I brought one of my favorite examples with me. This is from Champaign, Illinois. By the way, Garrett grew up in Champaign, Illinois. Um, and this doesn't look like much, but the way they sell their little recycling cart here is they say this is a benevolent monster who is always hungry and we've got to feed him constantly. And we've got to the lid for the mouth. I mean, it's hokey, but it's cute, and people get a chuckle out of it, and they see it everywhere. So, something that people can laugh, uh, you know, really uh, grasp. Um, you have a lot of different generator bases. You know, the folks, the tourists at the ski area are very different than the folks in the city of Steamboat, who are very different from unincorporated Rock County, right? They need to hear the same message, but maybe you package it differently. And you get that message out there over and over and over again. So, this is where the Council and YVI come in. Really important. Uh, piece and you don't want to see that get left behind. Um, and then policy. I've listed this as number seven. I don't mean that you leave it to the end to think about policy starts now and you work your way through again because it's a little bit of work and it needs to be really strategic. Um, let's just talk about what policy could include briefly because I think this is important. If we go back to Steamboat again and their ordinance, don't want to beat them up that it needs to be, it's, it's no good, that's not the case at all, it's a great start. What could we do with it to make it better? Right now, that ordinance requires tellers to report every year. My understanding is that hasn't been enforced. No data has come in, which made our job harder when we started. We had to go find that info. We've got it now, but why the heck have that in an ordinance if you're not going to enforce it? So that would be a great first step. And maybe you want to collect it more often than once a year. You can chat with the haulers about that. They're probably going to resist, but you know, have that dialogue. Also, um, the requirement, the ordinance only requires getting the word out when, you're, when there's initial service, really when the policy was implemented. So, so haulers are not necessarily, and I can't speak for all the individual ones, but they aren't necessarily out there saying every day to the, to the homeowners in Steamboat, hey, you're paying for recycling, you know that, right? Why aren't you doing it? You know, you're paying for it. Can we give you the service? Um, and we know that recycling costs money, so you can kind of get why that dialogue isn't happening. But let's use the ordinance to, to kind of force the issue a little bit. Let's require you get out in front of them every quarter, every half year, and, and remind them so you get more of them on board and actually using the service. Let's expand that beyond one and two units in our residential. Uh, easier said than done. There's issues. We can deal with waivers and exemptions, but let's talk about applying to more homes. Um, pay as you 
Let's talk about page here. Adding that to the ordinance. Um, expand development requirements. I very quickly mentioned that there is a requirement in the city that new multifamilies, large multifamilies, have to have a space for recycling. That's great. Let's make sure it's enforced. Anecdotally, I'm not sure if it's fully enforced. And let's make sure we don't just have a space for recycling, but there's actually a recycling program that's making recycling happen. So let's, you know, you got that in place. Let's now add a little flesh to it so it's actually effective. Um, the three towns. Um, I think we have Yampa here. But I'm not sure we've got Oak Creek and Hayden, is that right? I didn't hear them. Okay. These guys have the trash contract, and that's great. I mean, they, they found a hauler. They're making sure they get service for their residents. They've laid out some groundwork. Um, why not think about pay-as-you-throw there? If you get the same haulers doing pay-as-you-throw and steamboat, why not bring it to those smaller communities and increase the recycling counts coming out of there? At this moment, I probably would have to admit that curbside recycling in those towns isn't going to make a lot of sense because there aren't enough tons. But in 2025, we're going to have growth. So over the future, let's look at the viability of curbside recycling in those towns. There are communities in Colorado, Thornton is an example, they collect recyclables once a month. It doesn't have to be every week or every other. Let's look at that. So WEO curbside increases tons. Um, and they could be collecting data too. Route County, again, these are just suggestions. Um, Route County is the ideal place to have a vision and a real sustainability goal that deals with recycle, recycling and really pushes collaboration. How do we get, how do we find a way to encourage the towns to want to work with Route County and vice versa and want to work with each other? And then beyond that, the counties want to e work with each other. I mean, right now I know their politics and it's easier to just do my own thing and not have to deal with the bureaucracy of some other government. But maybe the benefits are strong enough and we can make that case and it really makes sense. Uh, maybe the county comes back in with the drop site and steamboat, we don't know. Um, and a disposal ban, if that happened down the road. You guys have got some good carb uh, cardboard disposal recycling options. Um, maybe a ban is effective and ideally that would happen at the county level. Just uh, it's easy for me to make suggestions. But uh, important. And again, I'm going to come back. I'm not going to belabor it, but the public policy process needs to be very strategic. This is the easiest place to just fall down. It's the easiest place to lose control of everything. Uh, because people don't understand the benefits and you have a lot of dynamics happening, very emotional, your public meetings can get crazy. I have worked with a couple of communities who have completely lost it on this step. You know, it just takes one person calling a city council with a death threat if they move forward with a recycling study to have council say, oh, this isn't worth it, I'm going to do police education, other stuff. So you really need a good process to think this out in advance, to get your leadership educated about facts and fiction before they get hit with it, um, to be prepared for the, the small majority of folks who are going to be really vehement and make sure you've got supporters, your stakeholder base there to balance everything. And just be prepared. Um, hiring a facilitator, I know it's more money, but it's that, um, I always get hung up on this, it's the penny wise pound foolish concept of not doing your planning up front and having the right people. I always say hire me less and bring in the right facilitator for a public process. Anyway, you cannot underestimate this step either. And then lastly, we just always have to be collecting, collecting data checking our performance, did this work, did it not, can we justify doing more, refining our programs, and that comes down the road. You're probably not going to get more data right now until 2014 is done, and you really want to wait until you get some programs in place and, and use that to gauge your progress and what you need to change. In the future, you can do all kinds of crazy things. More drop sites, be they single or multi-screen. You can do more with policies, really get into the multifamily and the commercial. That could be a real bang for the buck in this region. And then there's even the possibility of thinking, should we not bring interim materials management into Route County? Is there a point in the future when it might make sense for us to have a regional sorting facility for single stream or a, a more of a transfer station for all of our multi-stream? I think there's a ways to go because you need the tonnage to make that happen, but down the road this could make a lot of sense. That doesn't have to be just for traditional recyclables. You could do HHW, e-waste, special waste collection there. You could do outreach. This is capitally intensive, but it's something to think about as a longer term vision. Okay. Um, so again, short term, I think the drop site situation in Steamboat serving the county, I think education and outreach, and I think the city's policy expansion are the biggies for 2015. If you could get that done in the next 12 months, that would be great. Um, if we go forward and we make all kinds of good things happen just starting with those three, what could the future look like? Again, if our planning horizon is 2025, could we really bolster our recycling and organics? 
these numbers are a little bit pie in the sky, don't know, until you get some programs in place and decide what you're going to do. But if you could really ramp up recycling into the low 20%, again, this is of your municipal stream by weight, and you could similarly increase your organics and really reduce your, your reliance on land selling and help support our, our private service providers with other material management opportunities, huge, huge. Um, the county, the city looking at sustainability goals, this should be part of your long-term vision. Other quantitative benefits, um, your businesses and homeowners who aren't sending materials to the landfill are not paying that $17.40 a cubic yard. They may be paying, and they should see that benefit in their collection subscription costs. So that should be happening. And the simple act of recycling instead of putting our materials in a landfill reduces greenhouse gas emissions. And in this you know, age of global warming, that's really important. And there's huge numbers. Now, when we ship, turn around and ship those recyclables to market, we offset this by creating a few more. So again, we need to be honest to make sure we know what that balance is, but a potential huge benefit here. And then there's some non-quantifiable ones. Again, recycling is just such a tangible component of a sustainability plan. Your public sees it and gets it hands-on. Should be, should be there. Um, we've heard anecdotally from the ski corps and other areas that there's a demand. There is a demand for recycling. There are tourists who are actually call in advance and say, do you have thus and such in your recycling program because we're trying to decide whether to come here or go to Vail or Jackson Hole or somewhere else. So there's a demand and, and providing a better program allows them to give a better answer. And again, the ability to prove economics so that we can improve the viability of our private service providers, long-term commitment in our community, will bolster and make more stable our public programs. So really kind of the direction we have to go in. Realizing this is a bit vague and a bit broad, but our job is to get this on the table and now um, dig down into it a little bit. So I think this is where I am. You had a couple other slides, right? Did you want to go there now? Um, let's see. Let's, let's, we talk, I feel like we talked a little bit about that. Um, Obviously, we have, you know, can we go to, before we finish, you know that great slide that has the cost, the revenue, cost revenue? Um, yeah, just move on. Um, so this, you're talking the same with those? Oh, that one. Yes. Um, you want to talk about that? Oh, sure. I think this is such an awesome slide because from the, you know, we have the different components of, we talk about things that are recycling and composting and the cost and revenue. And people always say, well, is it worth it to recycle? And this is purely looking at the economic perspective. Sorry. No, what were you could. Okay. This is one of my backup slides, and it was, I really just had this in my back pocket to show you how tough it is to communicate with like, to the public. I mean, look at these two graphs. Um, but I guess the one on the right is a good example. This is not um, numerical. This is a Lori made up slide. And the point of the one on the right is to show some relative differences in cost and revenue of, of the three programs that we think about. Um, this is before TIP fees are assessed. So tip fees are typically assessed once we know, dang, we've got a net cost here, we've got to offset that. So forget that for a moment. Let's look at landfilling. Um, the blue is cost. So landfilling, landfill disposal across the country, and, and of course incineration is an issue away from Colorado, but disposal is pretty much all cost. We've got to bring that material in, we dump it on the ground, we've got to put it on the working face, we've got to compact it, we've got to put a cover on it, and then we've got to maintain that landfill for 30 years by, by regulation. So it's all cost. The only time we get that little number of revenue at the top is when we've got the big landfills in Colorado that collect landfill gas and do energy recovery. And I don't believe that's happening here yet. Um, so, so all cost. So that means I gotta have a tip fee there. I gotta, I gotta pay, I gotta charge something at my gate. Let's look at recycling. And I think I've been a little conservative here. I typically like to see half or better revenues you know, less, less uh, cost, more revenues. But I'm being conservative here because our market has been wacko lately. Recycling, yes, recycling cost. We have to collect that material. We have to get it to our intermediate processor. We have to do whatever we're going to do to it to ship it to markets. There's cost. But you know, the goal is to earn revenues on the back end. So if we have an efficient system, which isn't always true of our rural programs, but if we do, we're earning enough revenues to come close to offsetting our costs. So it isn't free, there's a lot of money involved, but look at the dy dynamics between the two. How can you not argue that recycling, e recycling economically, forget the environment, makes sense compared to disposal? Okay? Organics is almost the same. We drop the ball on organics or composting in Colorado and beyond because we don't drive the market 
as well. So we don't have markets that are going to pay good money on the back end or enough money on the back end. And that's kind of a shame on us and a shame on our DOTs, whether they're local or state. Um, so we don't, we don't offset quite as well for composting, and we're constantly working on that. We've got places to go with that. But the dynamic is better than landfilling typically. So I'm just trying to show that relativity. So often we do see a tip fee on composting. Hopefully it's not as high as our landfilling. That's the hope of why bother. Um, recycling, I do want to mention that single stream, I don't know what's happening with single stream. Maybe some of our uh, industry guys can talk to us about it. But with single stream, um, you know, we may, at some facilities, we may see tip fees like we do at Summit County on recycling. I hope not because that's not the direction we want to go in, but, but, the, but it is what it is in terms of the economics. So we often don't have tip fees for recycling, um, but we do for the other two. So. Just a quick question. Are you going to do questions on this? This is it. Oh, okay. Go for well, it. Well, no, I, I'm wondering about the scenario here. So, uh, you say recycling is economic here. Relative. What, relative. 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 Yeah. Absolutely. So, I mean, if we had a drop off site that was run by either the city or the county or some sort of public entity, and then we hauled it down to the closest sorting facility, which would be Eagle County, that would be all costs, right? At this point. So you got that, it. that wouldn't be necessarily, there wouldn't be any revenue in that scenario, yeah. right? Okay. As we know it right now, okay. you're right. Like I said, in rural, this doesn't always matter. But I would say before you did that, you'd have some, your commissioners and your council would have some good heart-to-heart -heart talks with Eagle County, yeah. you know, to, to see if that can change. And let's not forget, there is a transfer station in town. You know, waste management, it could be an outlet. Again, what are the economics there? So, you know, the multiple partners have to be sussed out. But you got that, you've got that right. So what are we going to do about that? If we have enough tons to take to Eagle County and it's high enough quality, could we not convince them to share some revenues? Keep in mind Eagle County really is very closely tied to a, to a private hauler as well. Eagle County, once they get done at their MRF, they hire, contract with waste management to haul those recyclables from their facility to Denver, not to sort, but to market in aggregate with all of the marketing that waste management does because they're massive marketers. You can imagine they have, what, 21 million customers in the country or something like that. Yeah, so, so there's still that dy dynamic Eagle County has to pay. So that's why they're not sharing revenues yet. Can we? I think that's what's so interesting about this whole thing. It's, to me, it's like the easy thing. I've done it for the 15, 20 years, right? Yeah. However long it's been around. Our HOA pays for it. Anyone in town, if they wanted to, could recycle. So we're talking about, uh, you know, people that potentially don't even want to pay $100 a month in HOA fees to have a recycling bin. I mean, we have providers that will take it. So I'm just, I'm struggling with the stick and the carrot type thing. You know, there, there's just such a fine line there because we do have options. 10, 15 years ago here in Steamboat, whenever that first ordinance was, we didn't have options. Right. So I, I mean, I'm just talking more than anything. It is hard to... It is hard to figure, you know, people have got it and they're already paying for it. Why aren't they doing it? Or when you make it so easy. And you'll never get 100%. But yeah, it is, it is a kind of a head scratcher. So how can we have more incentives, more education? A lot of questions. Well, I just want to um, take it back to that, which is, um, you know, getting, you know, along with Casey, what you're talking about, like, you know, kind of get just in time when we want to hear from you. And these are the things we kind of, thought of what are questions, um, you know, county-wide, and then city, industry, um, um, other businesses, nonprofits, doing um, your management, property management, chamber, um, and then, you know, and then this, how do we increase multi-family and um, commercial recycling? So, we could go by question, or you guys could, um, you want to just go by question? We don't have that much time, but um, you know, what do you see? So, county guys, Mike, you get you if it's gone. Um, what do you see the biggest uh, collection of needs category? Well, I think the big issue for the county is, um, you know, Lori's certainly uh, uh, you know, about it. We we have a program that's essentially unchanged in about I don't know, eight or ten years. We've, um, we've, talk, we've talked to the private haulers, and some of them have assured us that you know, the private sector will address recycling, but again, there's been no change. So, 
it appears it's gonna be a, a combination of public policy <coughs> as well as uh, on the city and the county and other local governments, and also a gigantic increase in revenue from multiple sources to kind of address this. The one thing we haven't talked about this morning that I think really has to be part of the solution nationwide is policy at the state and federal level so that we build into the purchase products the revenue source to recycle them, just as we've done with um, paint and electronics to some extent. So, um, you know, how we go about this, I mean, this is a daunting list of issues and, and questions, and how we move forward is, is really the, you know, the, biggest, the biggest question. So, I know there's leadership at the county, but uh, county won't do it alone. We do need council to, I believe, um, address the ordinance and enforce it as it was designed and expanded to include uh, commercial structures. And Clark, I mean, you guys are also, what do you see mm -hmm. as, your, as your need? Um, we're just starting out right now, so I mean, I'm still trying to gather all that information and trying to figure out what's going to be the best. I mean, we just started it a couple months ago, six months ago, so I'm just trying to learn as much as I possibly can on that. So right, you're just getting started. I mean, so obviously, before that program, the need was recycling, period? Right. Right. Um, Miampa? Well, the, the uh, drop-off container when it's there is very well used, not just by Yampa people, but the surrounding area. Um, I think the one of the <coughs> biggest problems that I've seen historically, um, well right now the town of Yampa isn't paying anything for that uh, container to be there. But historically, what I've heard from people that are not willing to pay to recycle is because they feel like the, you know, be it waste management or whoever, is getting paid at the end. Right. So I think education um, with, yeah. you know, with what, uh, what we're dealing with is huge in at least the rural communities, you know, I don't know about any place else. No, I, I think that's the misconception everywhere. Everybody thinks, you know, and and I don't mean that, you know, I'm giving you guys waste management as an example, but not that people say, waste management is charging five dollars? They're already making tons of money on recycling. Why are they charging five dollars? It's like, you don't understand, they're not making tons of money on recycling. And it, that is a huge misconception, for sure. So I think education. Um, okay. Uh, city ordinance. Do you guys want to offer some here? Yeah, I'll talk about the city ordinance. Um, you know, the question was asked at our last, there was one issue at the city council meeting of whether or not the city council supported recycling or not conceptually. So we did get agreement that there was no opposition or concern with supporting recycling. Um, as far as the changes to the current city ordinance, what I'd like to see, and does not now, but for the entire city council to see the slide where uh, there's some suggested changes that could be made. I mean, I think what you look at, as you look at the bullet points, there are some very obvious low-hanging fruit pieces, which is enforcement. Um, but then there are some more aggressive approaches that I don't know how the entire council would react to. So that's just a question that has to be, has to be discussed. Um, I think the bigger issue putting those two points together, and Mike nailed it, which is that this is an issue that, you know, the city can have its small role with its small ordinance, but truthfully, the solution needs to be the city and the county and the towns and the county working together on this. And, you know, we do have some successful ex examples of collaboration on things like water quality monitoring and other things that are of regional importance. So, you know, I guess what I'd say is that um, as a party of one, and, you know, <coughs> one or two, two of us, we can't predict what the other group, part of the group would want to do as far as changing the ordinance. But I do believe that um, there is will to have some regional collaboration around issues that are large in the city. And so, you know, when you start having these conversations about which 
domino is going to fall first. Um, it's hard to predict without knowing what our partners at the county would be willing to do. So you know, I guess that's a long-winded way to say I think the better question is, you know, can we initiate a regional collaboration that would look at the issues that are outlined here? <coughs> and that's what, you know, that's our hope. And so I didn't pay so new to say that. Um, <laughs> um, that's part of the reason why we're having you sign in because we want to, and you'll see on the, um, on the sign-in, it says um, continued involvement, yes, no. We want continued involvement because it is going to involve, you know, it's going to be, have to be collaborative. It's going to have to be representatives from the haulers and county and city and, you know, rural and other counties, Jackson and Moffitt. So, um, so I know everybody's saying like, I'm really busy. But if we want to see this move forward, if we want to see it become at a point where the haulers aren't losing their shirts um, and we see the benefit across the county and region-wide, it's going to involve um, some uh, a task force or stakeholder involvement. So, yeah. Um, I would encourage you guys to also consider, if you're looking at a regional approach, which would benefit Jackson County, probably also Moffitt County, Rio Blanco, don't stop the state line. Uh, yeah. You've got, you could double your recycling with your carrot right now is glass. If you guys take glass, you need to figure out how much you can take, whatever it is, but that's what killed our recycling program. But if, if the people we recycle with know that you take glass, you have an opportunity there to double your recycling for them. Instead of hauling it to Denver, which is two hours, they can haul it from Laramie to Steamboat, which is two hours. They have the same amount of hauling time. You can double what you guys are doing for recyclables, which waste management, if it, we did a multi-stream because that's how they did it, it's going to be easier to do so your transfer station starts to make a lot more sense. But don't discount across state lines. Saratoga and Kamet, they do the same thing because they take theirs to Rollins, then to Laramie now. To, now they're driving all the way to Colorado Springs. So the economy hey. scale, you have that uh, availability to increase your potentials thinking right. outside of what the region really is. So, uh, That's an expert. Yeah. Okay. So, um, industry. Um, where do you guys see industry going with single stream? Ace is high as well as waste management because you guys are collecting single stream as well, right? You're collecting single stream commingled, right? Either one of you. What, what do you What do you see? Are we right to be worried? What's coming? I really don't have any worries about it at all. I'd kind of like to, uh, yeah, I'd love to know what my future's going to be. This morphing back and forth is driving me crazy. There's certain things that, I mean, I'm impressed here. I really am. But you all have come a long, long way in what you have learned in the last 10 years of what it's going to take to make things, to, to get more recycling back into the, into the stream. <clears throat> One thing I would like to see is some real conversation regarding glass, the environmental benefit of recycling glass in Route County. We are not using up a precious resource. It's sand. It doesn't deteriorate. It doesn't create greenhouse glasses. It is the weight that we haul. Mm -hmm. It is the uh, damage to our machinery. We are not very much in favor of this glass thing. As far as twin landfill using it, what they could collect and what, what it's used for is cover, correct? Road base. Road base and cover. What they collect in, in whatever spans of time isn't that much when it comes to what they are, if they're using it for cover, the depth of the cover on the landfill and that sort of thing. When you crush all that glass up, it would be a whole lot easier to get a couple of scoops of dirt out of a bank with the loader and just cover the trash that way because we're just putting, we're, we're putting energy into recycling glass. It's not an environmental waste and we do not have a landfill problem here in Mount County. There's a hundred years, a couple hundred years of capacity left, present growth rates. That's one thing that I would like to see a addressed. Lot. Could help. A lot. 
All of us haulers a lot. We you didn't you have to deal with that. Are you wondering at the capacity of the, these guys to store and crush the glass and use the glass on site? Is that what your question is? What's your capacity? Can, can you guys have a greater capacity of storing the glass, crushing the glass, using the glass? Well, we have more capacity than what we're using now. Right. But it's probably finite, your demand. I mean, you probably can't take a hundred times what you've got now every year. You only have so much need, right? I, I don't believe that was the question. I oh, believe, okay. I believe there was a point made that does recycling glass in Route County really make sense when you consider the weight that is transported out of the valley, the offset of the greenhouse gases, the wear and tear on the machinery, versus what Twin Enviro actually does with it. Right. Which is, you know, crush it up and use it for road right. I The environmental benefit we recycle to enhance the environment. It ain't got anything to do with what mom and pop have to pay for to get rid of their trash. It's, we started this thing. Everything was started. The committee got together because they wanted to, yeah, reduce their mm -hmm. carbon footprint, as I understand. Um, it seems like an intelligent thing to do. I'm not arguing the point. Rules were made for the haulers that made it extremely difficult for us to, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Apply so you want to apply logic to the situation, huh? Well, yeah, I, a business has to make money. Right. I don't think there's anybody right. in this room. And you know, there, there are a lot of communities that um, have single stream plus, they call it, much like Loveland. And so we've seen a lot of communities around the country keep glass out. They just keep glass out of the single stream, they still recycle it. Not too many communities are saying to heck with glass altogether, we're going to trash it, just because the public has such a heart, your public believes glass is recycling. So it's, you know, but it is, a, that's a really good point, and it is a struggle. It is a, it's, it's our nemesis on the recycling program, and it's, it, what, it has a lot to do with what drives our costs down in any program. So it's a really good point. My mind is worrying here. I've heard a lot of good things, and a lot of things have kind of confused me. Um, I'm encouraged by what, what has been learned in the last 10 years. Uh, I had one, one last question about the whole thing. You said that the, the landfill has to pay a per cubic yard fee, or they charge a tipping fee. Was it 40 cents? Yes. In the county? Okay. Per cubic yard. They. We are charged per ton. How does that equate to per cubic yard? It's a conversion. Do you want to go ahead, Mike? Yeah, there's a conversion. So that fee was initially 25 cents in 1998, I believe, for solid waste management activities in the county and recycling. And then it was um, <coughs> modified to 40 cents a cubic yard to provide some financing for the bridge that was reconstructed. The bridge that, you know, that is on the county road that accesses the, the landfill. So um, the way the, the ordinance or resolution is worded, it, it is by a cubic yard, and there is a conversion license, um, the conversion to the tonnage. Well, that answers that question. Is that done on uh, compacted waste or oh, all waste? Oh, always. So the fee is the same for compacted yard or ton or loose yard or ton. See, if the county had to haul that, like Jackson County does, they change it to ton because it, it doesn't work out the same. It doesn't. Not even close. Yeah. You got a guy. You got a thirty yarder full of uh, uh, asphalt shingles. Mm -hmm. Twelve ton. A I mean, truck. A third of the volume. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, but they'll find if they had to haul it, like we did, <coughs> they figure that out. Um, anything else with the single stream? I, I've got one quick statement. You know, single stream was instituted, and quite frankly, was was a home run. You know, it was really a way to really increase uh, volume tonnage. This is something that Lori mentioned earlier. Just tremendous, um, tremendous step in the right direction. From decades of no change, it was a tremendous step in the right direction to get people involved, to make it easier, to increase tonnage, um, and it's done well. Now that it's been around long um, enough time, we're learning from it. Mm -hmm. um, single stream can be confusing. You see the sticker on the on the trash can. You say, "Wow, yes, uh, uh, I'm confused. I'll, I'll put it in, or I won't put it in, or I will I will participate, or I won't participate." Um, single stream can be simplified. It's actually three things. It's it's um, cardboard, 
non-shredded paper and containers. And that's that single street. Um, containers incorporates a lot of steel and aluminum and plastics, one through seven, but bottom line, they're containers. Um, Non-threaded paper and cardboard. It's actually pretty simple when you, when you, when you um, spell it out that way. Um, the stuff we find in single stream, you'll find a tricycle in single stream, and somebody will say, well, it's metal, <laughs> you know, or, or, a, or a single mill tunnel or something. It's aluminum, yeah. and it's just not, not the way the system is designed. So education is important, but and when, we, when we simplify single stream into those three major compartments, it makes it much easier and the quality gets a lot better. What we've learned from single stream is that glass is a problem, clearly. Um, glass, from the weight of shipping of it, to the uh, destroying of it, to crushing it, to getting shards in there, all the rest of the material, and devaluing the rest of the three materials, is a challenge. We believe in, in glass recycling, bottle to bottle. Sun Waste Management is very fond of here in Colorado. We do have an outlet, fortunately, in Denver that does accept it, and if it's clean, we get a, a nice chunk of money on the back end. Not a black number at the end of the day, it's still a red number, like all recycling is. Um, but um, we believe in bottle to bottle recycling, and that's one way to do it, to keep it out of glass. We've, we've learned that from single stream, that at the end of the single stream process, it's no more than landfill cover anyway by the time it gets um, busted and, and, and contaminated and shards and stuff are created. So, what we've learned from single stream is it's a tremendous home run. How do we fine tune it? One of the biggest biggest uh, um, challenges is getting glass out of single stream. Summit County, as many of you know, has um, developed an ordinance to get glass out of single stream, and they're mandating it, no glass in single stream, um, and all the haulers are supporting that. Um, and we are collecting it at drop sites and taking it to Denver and, and, and uh, recycling bottle to bottle. That's what we believe in. Landfilling or landfill cover doesn't make a big difference to us. It's still landfilled. Um, but bottom bottle is where it's at, and then quite frankly, we're willing to to, um, to to manage money differently to make sure that that happens. So bottom mm -hmm. bottle is something we believe in. That uh, we're kind of on an island there sometimes, but um, um, to let you know our position on glass recycling, get it out of single stream, get it separated, and get it down to Denver for bottom bottle recycling. So it, home run single stream. What we've learned from it one step further is how we fine tune it. I don't think see it going away. Where's it going with single stream? I see it continuing to grow. Do you? That's great. And, um, and uh, education to help us fine tune it to where it is really uh, more, more uh, um, a true recycling program and not just landfill cover. So you, you wouldn't necessarily see a, a big correction coming or a big change. We I just got to keep getting smarter and improving our technology and our creative thinking. Correct. All the, all the directive I've been giving is, is um, exactly that. Okay. Really good to hear. Thanks, yeah. Kevin. Do you think bottle to bottle would work um, in SIPA with our additional transport? You've got the typical challenges with any rural community of, of you know collection, whether it be drop site or, or routed. And I don't know any glass routes in the mountains anywhere, but a, but a central collection site and then getting it to market and hope you break even is that's that's the glass game. Yeah. And we have a brand new glass recycler coming to the front range. I don't know if that's exactly what you were alluding to, but we have a new one coming. We think in the next year or so, which you guys have been working closely on, and that will improve the economics, but it's still in the front range. So, yeah, you know, constantly evolving, changing every day. Take glass out of single stream completely and it's twice as effective uh, um, operationally and economically yeah. typically. And more, more valuable. Yeah. Um, so this is for Jackson. Um, so what benefits do you guys see for intergovernment collaboration? Can you talk a little bit about that, Matt? I don't know. Um, it would bring back our program. It's a, our recycling program is something that I don't think we as a county, as a community, can sustain independently anymore. We're going to have to piggyback off of something that's already there, or maybe if you, if, see, if our county becomes a hub, I think it could be a spoke, but I don't, independently, it's not something that we can sustain. But there is a strong interest in it. Okay. There's a strong community interest. People are still the hardcores are bringing their stuff here um, in the back of their trucks or whatever um, to recycle. But it's, uh, it would benefit us, I mean, as Matt was saying earlier, we're a transfer station. We don't have our own landfill. Our trash goes to Larimer County. Um, <clears throat> so since the, um, I can only speak for my household, but you know, our trash has increased tremendously. You know, and we do it you know, per bag at the transfer station. We don't have, um, we don't participate in the house, the curbside pickup, um, but just, you know, since April or whenever, it's gone, increased at least double. 
And the whole distance you guys had from um, Walden to Laramie, is that roughly the same as what it might be from Walden to Steamboat? Yeah, it's real close. Okay, okay. Time wise, it's almost. And you have your containers already, and a means of moving them. Oh well, no, ARC pro ARC provided those. ARC provided. Okay, so. Uh, state recycling grants are due in March. Right. You guys, know. you know, you got your numbers. You could, you could capitalize for your equipment. You know, but it. Our county commissioners actually had conversations with waste management about bringing a uh, a trailer. The drop-off trailer. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's something that is for our community. <coughs> we are already practicing that. But the pickup um, size would be great because they're right. More you know, like we at our transfer call and have them come get right. it. Yeah, we had to bring it to the transfer station anyways. People are already conditioned to a drop-off site and a trailer would be perfect for us. Right. To, you know. And again, hate to have too much time go by when people aren't recycling because you lose that momentum just like in season. Well, I mean, right at this point, like we're not, we can't start something up. Yeah. We just can't recycle yeah. without being able to take it anywhere. Right. Yeah. Right. So all the more demand on route to maybe help find a read or together to find a regional solution. So one, one quick challenge I mentioned the trailers I thought I'd throw out there too is um, Safeway would require four probably five trailers. Okay, um, for each, week, each weekend just to give you a rough idea of the volume that, that they took. The yeah. Okay, so it costs to be higher. On the other hand, if they were there six days a week, open six days a week, it wouldn't be the glut on the weekends, maybe. But I, I get your point. That that two two. Two was kind of an average, and I'm just kind of thinking you probably did probably two of them maybe right. in the city in the future. Again, fantasy land, but good. And the point. only successful drop sites that I've seen in, 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 in um, all the counties that I work with are we have two things. They're either manned or woman manned, manned persons or locked or by volunteers typically, um, and locked outside of those hours, or they're high definition cameras on them. Yeah. They can tell you the time of your watch that you threw that illegal item into the can, yeah. Uh, so they're either patrolled and monitored tightly or they're manned. And those are the ones that are successful and sustainable. Right. Now, outside, Teton, outside of that, they're dump sites. Yes, I, and that have, we've seen that in Eagle and other places, right? Um, Teton County makes it work without that, but they find business fire departments, say, that they put them adjacent to the fire department. When there's, they keep them open when there's activity and it mi minimizes the illegal dumping and that sort of thing. And then they do lock them down at night. But they don't... To the tune of, to the tune of uh, monitoring it or... or right, monitoring. right. But the staffing adds costs. Exactly. So if you can avoid so the that... Ones, but the ones in Aspen are, are high-definition cameras. The ones in Grand County are manned. Yep. And they're both sustainable and both do very well. Right. Um, but the next step of, of staffing it or, or, or monitoring it tightly has to happen or it, they're not sustainable. They become dump sites and they go away. No, nope. the hauler didn't want to haul it. The end, use, the end market is in landfill anyway, and the poor business owner who donated his land to be used wants it out of there as fast as possible. So, staffing it or monitoring it tightly, um, and one of the, uh, or putting it in a location where it would take quite some nerve to to illegally dump on it, such as a police station or fire. Right, station. right. Good, good point. Right. Uh, I wonder if we can get Jim to explain his uh, model that he's using. Ours is just basically we got two containers that the community kind of pays for as far as their dumping is concerned. It's uh, volunteer based. It's twenty-five dollars for every six months for recycling. That piece. Twenty-five for six months, not twenty-five dollars per six months per household. And if they want to do a one-time fee, it's a seven dollars for them to open the containers, do the recycling, and which during the summer months it has a tendency to actually start overfilling in those containers. So um, my curiosity would be maybe get with waste management or to have an extra, you were saying as far as a bottle recycling, have another container for the bottles or glass containers or something like that that we could do like a single stream but a multi-stream or something like that that would help them so we wouldn't continue to keep putting glass in there, which is contaminating the products. But that seems to work pretty well. And is it locked in glove and combination? It is locked in combination, and yeah. the combination changes every six six months when they pay the tag. When they pay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's think that's slick. I think that's real and creative, and you guys did that yourself. Whether that would work with a lot more people, 
might be might might that might be well, a question. Well, there's more people than the fee would probably go down as far as that's concerned. Right. We're just trying to make <coughs> enough money to pay for the service. Yeah. You could do things like Steamboat Two. You, could, you know what I mean? You do it by community or every single HOA could do that. Yep. So, um, yep. I just how many how many people um, are participating in that right now? Um, off the top of my head, I am. I'm guessing right around 200, maybe a little less, probably about 100 off the top of my head. So you have 100 people participating in a multiple dumpster arrangement Correct. in the community of Clark, which is probably what percentage of that population would you say is participating? Probably about one fifth. We're running about 500. So a fifth of that population is participating, is willing to pay. And, and just out of curiosity, Having to subsidize this, or is it no? Is it breaking even? That I don't know. Kelly Super is the one kind of in charge on this, kind of the housing part of it all, and I don't know all the financials as far as where she is on the financial side of it. So. Okay. And um, how about the cleanliness around the area? Have you been having problems with having to fix stuff up every day? No. I, it seems to be very clean and tidy. I haven't had any problems whatsoever except for um, I did have to get a locking dumpster for our for the bears. It seems to have a little more smell, so the bears kind of came around there. But after that, it hasn't been a problem as far as the dumping. Okay, is this on a scheduled dump cycle, or is it you have to call and have a dump? It's on a schedule every two weeks. So every two weeks. Every two weeks, it's yeah. scheduled. Even when it's full, it seems to be right on the right time that it's being picked up. So, and I think that was from the initial startup of it, the program. It was everyone was collecting it. The first initial, all right, I gotta get rid of everything out of my back of my pickup or wherever they've been storing and recycling. So it seemed to be minimized now, not overfilling. So it seems to work. It's working well as far as that's concerned. Um, Marlon and I, did you guys want to, we're wrapping up, but I'm like, did you guys want to have any input or discussion? Uh, I think no. everything has been covered. Okay, thanks. Um, thank you. Well, um, I want to be respectful of time. Um, we do have some snacks out there if you want to stay and chat a little bit longer. Um, we definitely, again, thank Grab County and P4 for funding for this study. Um, and thanks everybody for coming. Make sure you sign in. We will get the PowerPoint and notes from the meeting um, after everybody participated and I'm sure we'll be reaching out to you about helping us move forward. Thanks.